Welcome back BGE Physics to another episode of Mr Bull talking about key area 3 and this time we're looking at radiation so let's dive in because we've got four things that we're discussing today refraction of light, practical applications on the refraction of light, the visible spectrum and waves and the EM spectrum okay so let's crack on with the refraction of light. Now refraction's definition is that it can cause light to change direction as it passes from one material to another. So that's quite a difficult thing. But let's just pause and say the light also travels in straight lines. It doesn't squiggle around like that. It always goes in straight lines. So let's show an example of what we mean by refraction. So we know that it changes direction as it goes from um, one material to another. We also know that we have a beaker of water here. And if you have a pencil like this and we drop it into the beaker, then lift up the beaker with, a, with the water and look at it side on, we'll see that the, the pencil doesn't quite match up. It comes in and when it goes into the water, it looks like it's kind of slightly off. So there's a misalignment in what's happening in the beaker here. Now, what does that actually mean? It means that the light is changing direction as it goes from the glass, as it goes from the water, sorry, to air. And so therefore we're seeing a slightly different image coming from the bottom part of the water than from the top part. There's a change in direction and that's what refraction is. Now I'm going to show you some blocks that we would normally be doing as an experiment in the classroom, but obviously we're watching here. So I'm going to show you this in, a, in, a, in three blocks that will give you another idea of what we mean by refraction. So if we were to have a glass block like this, a normal rectangular glass block, and we have a ray of light that goes in, we can see that as it goes from one material, which is air, into another material, in this case perspex, it changes direction. And that direction there is clearly different to that one there. Now when we have a triangle, it goes in, and again you can see that it changes direction. It changes direction here, and it changes direction here because it's going from one material to another, and then one material to another. And lastly, when we have some sort of semicircular block, again, look, it changes direction where one material meets another material. So refraction is the change in direction from when light travels from one material to another. Okay, and you can see that every time we've done this, light is only traveling in straight lines. But let's look at some practical applications on the refraction of light, all right? Now, First of all, we're going to talk about some lenses, because we know when you think of lenses, you probably think of your camera, probably think of maybe a telescope or a microscope, and these are all amazing applications of lenses and of refraction. But what we're going to look at is specifically convex, concave lenses, and then talk about our eyes, okay? The things that are very close to us that you're watching this right now with. So first of all, convex lenses are lenses that are an oval shape. And this lens here is focusing at X point, okay? That's a focus point. Now, we also have concave lenses. Concave lenses look like a cave and they spread out the way. Okay, the light comes through and it spreads out. So convex, it spreads in, it goes towards an X shape. That's why we say convex with an X. And then concave, it's like a cave shape and it goes out the way, spreads out the way. All right? Now, why is that important? Well, let's talk about the eye. Because the eye, this is all the things to do with the eye, the optic nerve, the retina, the cornea, the pupil, the iris, the lens, there's lots of different parts to the eye. We're specifically going to worry about the lens and what that means. Just a few other things though. We know that the cornea is the thing that protects the eye, it's the thing that covers the eye, and we also have a slight refraction, a change of light as it goes through the cornea as well. And we also know the optic nerve and the retina are the things that actually collect the data and send it to the brain so we can formulate an image in our heads. Now, this is a normal eye, seeing something from very far away. We see that the light comes in and it, it perfectly focuses at the back of the eye so we can see it, okay? Perfectly focuses at the back of the eye. Now, when our something moves then from far away to close up, something changes. We see that the rays of light are now kind of coming from a point nearby and we'll see that our lens actually has to change to being thinner so that means it can focus at the back of the eye. So see how it goes from there to there. All right, so our, our, a lens changes. It's a biological lens that changes so we can focus the light at the back of the retina. Now that there is perfect vision. But what happens if someone like me does not have perfect vision? So for someone who is short-sighted, 
you will see that things that are far away, remember the, the lines are now parallel again, from a distant object, comes in, and you see that the focus point is not in the retina, it's in front of the retina, which means that there's not a, there's not a perfect image at the retina, which means it's blurry, which is what people see when they don't have good eyesight. So how do we fix that? Well, this is someone who's short-sighted, they can't see things that are far away, we can only see things that are short. And so what happens is we need to get a concave lens, put it in, the concave lens spreads out the waves, our eyes then spread in the waves, but it, because it's been spread out first, the light now focuses at the retina, all right? So that's how you correct someone who's short-sighted, is you give them glasses with concave lenses in them, all right? So that's the first thing. But what happens if it's the opposite? If someone can't see things that are close up, now your parents or your grandparents might be people like this, who can't read the books and they have to put them far away because they can't see things that are close to them. They are long-sighted, they all can only see things that are a long way away. And when the light comes in, their lens just doesn't refract it enough and it focuses out at the back. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to get a lens that corrects that and brings it in a little bit sooner. So we use a convex lens. Comes in, it refracts, it refracts the lens here and it meets at the retina at the back of the eye. So that's how we would correct someone with long sighted. So if you've got glasses or you know someone has glasses, this is a prime example of refraction of light and a good application in how we can help people with bad eyesight. Now, let's now talk about the visible spectrum and waves, all right? Now, with a triangle, we saw that triangle and how light refracts through the triangle, we can then do something quite nice. We can actually start passing white light through the triangle and see what happens. Now, when we do that, and sorry for the, for the pixelation here, but we'll see that when we pass white light through um, a triangular prism, we can see that there is refraction, the light is changing direction, but we see that also what happens is that there's a, there's a spread of colour. Now, we actually know that white light is made of all these different types of colours, and it's actually called Roy G. Biv, i.e. red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, the colours of the rainbow that you'd be aware of, which, incidentally, is exactly what happens in a rainbow. It's just the light that's refracting through raindrops rather than through a prism. Now, we know that waves carry energy. Now, we say white light, light is a wave. We know it is a wave of some sort. And um, we know that light refracts. We know that it refracts into the lovely colors. We could expand more on that. But we also then want to go into waves and talk about well, what are waves then? And waves are just things that carry energy from one place to another, all right? Now, this is a big, big diagram. Don't worry too much about it. It's just got a few bits of information I want to touch on. We have like things like wavelength, which is just the length of a wave. Okay, we have things like the amplitude, which is the height of the wave. We have things like crest, which is the top of the wave. And we have things like trough, which is the bottom of the wave. And these are just some key things here that we need to know as scientists about waves. Okay, now, the more energy you put into a wave, the higher the amplitude of the wave. Remember, the amplitude is the thing, it's the height of the wave. Now, that makes sense. If you have a big tidal wave, you're going to have a big wave, which means a big amplitude. So we know that the more energy there is, the greater the amplitude of the wave. We also know that wavelength is measured in this thing called lambda, which is a Greek letter, and that's the kind of Greek symbol there, right? Remember, it's the length of one wave. And why is that important? Well, we often sometimes like to say that red, green, and blue colours are, they have a specific wavelength of light, and it's a very, very small wavelength. We're talking like 0 0.0000007 meters. Very, very, very small for what we can see in that spectrum, okay? Now, the last thing is a frequency. And again, I'm not too worried if you don't know this, but a frequency is just how many waves pass a point. So we think about music, we think about frequencies, we think about radios. We just know that in frequency is just the number of waves that you have that are going through in a certain time frame. So 10 waves that pass in two seconds, 10 divided by two is five. That'd be five hertz. And that's the unit. Just like we've been talking about in other things like Newtons for force and um, like kilograms for mass, we have hertz for frequency and that's eight cents. 
The higher the pitch of a sound, the higher the frequency. So if you have a guitar, the higher the note, the higher the frequency. Now let's finish off with the EM spectrum. Now the EM spectrum is something that you guys will be maybe familiar with, with some things at least. So I just want to rattle through a, a, a bunch of them, okay? So we have talked about light, the visible light. That is part of the EM spectrum and part of a wider spectrum. And that spectrum contains gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible light, infrared, microwaves, TV waves, and radio waves, some of which you're, I'm sure you've been aware of. Gamma rays have high frequency, lots of waves packed in together, whereas radio waves have a low frequency, lots of waves spread out. We have short wavelength for gamma, which means, again, they're pressed in really tightly, and radio waves very long wavelengths, all right? This is a very dangerous part of the spectrum. This is a not-so-dangerous part of the spectrum, all right? We also know that we travel all at the speed of light, which is a very fast 300 million meters per second. And every single one of these travels at that speed so fast. So examples, radio, you know, a radio, okay? Radios use radio waves. Microwaves use microwaves, okay? To cook your food, they concentrate the microwaves in there. Infrared, infrared ca uh, and cameras, showing the heat of something that is infrared radiation. Visible light, well, that's what we see, the red, the blues, the greens, that's everything we see is visible light. We cannot see anything else other than visible light. Ultraviolet, things from, your, from the sun, you need to use sun cream to protect yourself from UV light. So sunbeds and all that, don't go in sunbeds, it's dangerous, but that's the idea of what UV light is. X-rays, X-rays are the things that you've probably got if you had a broken bone. And again, they're quite, quite dangerous on a large scale, but in a short scale, like an x-ray that you take from your bones is absolutely fine. And last one, gamma. Gamma is basically a very radioactive, very dangerous wave, and normally associated with things like stars and um, some particular elements in chemistry are very radioactive and give off gamma radiation, okay? And this is a, a star that was observed to be the brightest star ever, but it was giving off a whole bunch of gamma radiation. So, that is what that is a summary of the electromagnetic spectrum, and these are some uses that you can kind of pause the video and have a look through. All right, so lots of different things here that we would use each of these things. Notably, gamma, radi gamma rays can be used to treat cancer, um, ultraviolet can treat some skin conditions, um, microwaves can be used in your mobile phones, satellites, all of that stuff. So have we look at that and I hope that it makes sense. And that is it. That is the whole key area number, um, well, I think it's number two or number three. Um, number three. And um, hopefully that makes sense. It's understandable, but that's all about radiation and I hope that went well. Guys, have a good one and I'm sure to see you soon. Bye.